Miniature Market has thousands of board games at discounted prices. Click the direct link below to see all of those discounted games. Hello my friends, today I can't believe we're already going to the convention season. Gen Con awaits us next week from when this video launches. I'll be at Gen Con. It's crazy. I cannot believe it's already here. Today, I'm going to be going over my top 10 anticipated games at Gen Con. So a few notes here. First of all, these are anticipated. I have not ever played or touched any of these games. I'm, these are just like the ones I'm excited about just by reading and seeing pictures and such. Now, if you want a list that's a little bit more tried and true, uh, next week, early next week, I'm going to be launching my top 10 games at Gen Con. These are ones that I've already played. I've had the pleasure of playing early copies or, or just right last week. And I have some that I love that I played that are tried and true that I've already played that I love. And that list is coming out next week. So if you're not a subscriber, go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss that one. Uh, without, that, without further ado, let's go. Top 10 most anticipated. Number 10. Number 10. Number 10. Number 10. All right, before I get to my number 10, I want to do a couple of honorable mentions because number one, I don't try not to put expansions on this list, but there is an expansion coming out that I think many people are excited, including me. It's an expansion for Radlands. It's called Cult of Chrome. Uh, and this is from Roxley Games. Uh, and this has basically, it keeps everything very streamlined, everything balanced, except there's 32 new camps, which will help you, you know, lots of variability, lots of uh, changing strategies and such. And 10 of them are rebalanced from the original game that you can replace those with. Now, you don't have to replace those if you loved one that was replaced, but there's 10 rebalanced and 32 new ones, and it just changes the game without changing the game, which sounds really interesting. They didn't want to change, add me mechanism because the game's so streamlined. Um, but that's one of them. The second honorable mention is a game that was already out many years ago and is being re-released. It's called Maki Master. Now this was originally uh, Wasabi back from 2008. Now this adds new mechanisms, streamlined rules, and fresh art. And I was a big fan of Wasabi. It's one of those games that was hard to get after it went out of print. A lot of people love it. And I'm glad to see it's coming back in the beautiful form from Kids Table Board Games. They always make things look gorgeous. Uh, and I'm glad that they're bringing that out. So, uh, number 10. This is called Star Tycoon. Now, in this, this is from Good Games Publishing. Uh, and in this, you're gonna take on the role of an interstellar business with the goal of outperforming their business rivals uh, by the last round of the end of the game. Now, central to the Star Tycoon, tycoon, uh, tycoon is a galactic exchange. This essentially is a fluctuating market that reacts to supply and demand. Now, you need to know when to buy, when to sell, and that's key to a profitable business. Now, I typically love economic games. I love uh, games that have lots of interaction. I love fluctuating markets. Uh, and this just looks really cool. There was a game back in the day called Star Cartel, which was a space game fluctuating market game, which is a lot smaller and quicker. This one, from what I can see, is a smallish box, but it's a decently sized game. It's, it's, it's supposed to, everyone's saying it's playing, it plays bigger and longer than it looks. I think it's like 60 to 90 minutes. Um, and the publisher is one of those smaller publishers called Good Games Publishing, and I think they're quite underrated. Uh, they had Fluttering Souls, which was like a butterfly game that used sort of a Seven Wonders dual drafting mechanism. They had Too Many Cooks, which was like a real-time cooperative game that had some similarities to like uh, Decorum from Floodgate Games. They had Land vs. Sea. Games that didn't make huge splashes but were very good, and it's one of those smaller publishers that, that makes, that, that, that does good stuff. And, and they're, I think they're quite underrated, so I love when they come out. So I'm excited about Good Games Publishing coming out with this uh, Star Tycoon. Number nine. Uh, this next one is another sort of economic game, Stock Exchange, with stock spelled S-T-A-L-K, because this is about uh, flowers and such, or the stock. And so I think that's like sort of a clever thing. Now, in this game, you find yourselves in the community hedge fund, where players take on the roles of gardeners dedicated to growing flowers and profits. Now, when the market crashes, the gardener with the most valuable stock, S-T-A-L-K, portfolio wins. Now, you're going to be planting the seeds of investments to grow your portfolio. You're going to be surrounding, surrounding them with flowers to harvest their value. You're going to be trading your stocks at the exchange to keep up with trends and collaborating with your opponents to grow shared investments or outmaneuver them and cause their favorite flowers to wither in value. Now again, I like fluctuating markets. I like strong interactions. I like economics. I think the theme is cool. I think the way they clevered, they, they did that. 
Another interesting thing here is this game is not just about buying and selling and doing markets. It has an abstract component where you're placing flowers and seeds out on a board. And depending on where you place it and what surrounds it, that is going to help affect the market. So I, that's what's really the catch here is, is in addition to the things I normally like, that twist of having it be sort of an abstract game on top of that, which is driving the pricing and such, is why this one is interested to me. And that's Stock Exchange from The Op. Number eight. The next one is a, I'd say a medium weight Euro game from Board and Dice, who in my opinion is like one of my favorite, if not my favorite sort of Euro game company, because every every year they come out with a couple of these and and I'm not, a, I like Euro games, but I I like a lot of interaction too. So they tend to make ones that, that, that really hit me hard. And this Windmill Valley, uh, and in this case, players are taking on the role of tulip farmers and entrepreneurs. Now you'll be building and enhancing your windmills. You'll be looking for new tulip bulbs in foreign trades or among local vendors to buy and plant. And you'll be trying to get an edge with hired help and lucrative contracts. And you're gonna let your blooming fields make your competitors green with envy. Uh, now in this game, you're gonna have your own sort of wheel. You're gonna be enhancing your wheels by adding in, uh, different types of actions. And you're gonna be building your engine. You're gonna be planting tulips in your fields, which will score you victory points at the end of the game, but you're gonna be building windmills on the main board to activate rewards from adjacent fields. Uh, and in that case, you're going to be doing that with a lot of interaction. So I like that it has the standardized sort of uh, access of, uh, you know, the head down, I'm building my own board, I'm doing my own engine building and stuff. I like that it has that aspect of it because I do like that aspect of Euros, but I also like Euros that have more interaction. I like that there is a central board that you're gonna be moving things out into and that there's only a certain amount of spots and where you go has to do with adjacencies and you can be rushing to different spots with with players. So I like that it, sounds, it seems like it, there's some player interaction there as well. It looks beautiful and that whole wheel thing with the way that you're building engines and upgrading those actions and stuff, it just seems like it's gonna be pretty cool. Uh, and that is Windmill Valley from uh, Board and Dice. Number seven. Number seven. This next one uh, was a Kickstarter, and it appears to be from a sort of a smaller publisher called We're Sinking. Uh, it's from Ludimus Games. It looks like they're like in the middle of starting the fulfillment for their Kickstarter that happened a couple years ago. Uh, this is a three to six player game. It is a secret action taking survival game where you're gonna take on the role of pirates, I love pirate games, on a ship under siege. Now, as the ship takes damage, the crew must work to repair the ship and defeat one of the threats. So you have the Kraken, you have skeleton pirates, you have uh, uh, different sirens, but while you're keeping the, uh, the ship from sinking, and but you're gonna figure out how to work with your other players. Will you or your fellow crew instead to choose to selfishly pocket treasure as precious time runs out? Now, if you can manage to take out the threat, uh, the game then ends and then you win if you have the largest treasure score. But if the ship sinks before taking out the threat, you win by having the fewest cards in hand. So this is interesting because players are constantly making tough decisions uh, as you're trying to weigh your own goals. Because again, you want to have the most treasure in the end, um, but you're trying to, you know, if the ship sinks, everyone loses, but you're trying to have the most treasure in the end. So it has that interesting semi-co-op aspect where you're trying to sort of push your luck. You're trying to really be out for yourself, but you're out for everybody else. And this type of game always does well with my with my group. Uh, and this just looks like it's, uh, it's, I love the theme. I love the way everything works. The components look cool. Uh, we like these sort of backstabby style games. So we're sinking why it's on this list. Number six. This next one uh, is called Hi-Fi. And this is from Smirk and Dagger Games. I got a chance to take a look at this at the uh, Origins Game Fair at the press night. And one thing that's cool is, first of all, there's the story of this game is the Meeples, not the Beatles, but the Meeples broke up. And there's sort of like a magazine cover that is the rule book. And it's just such a clever, and it looks like a popular magazine that, you know, Rolling Stone and stuff like that. It looks really cool. Uh, but this game has a record as action selection. And I think that is so, so cool. Because again, in 1974, the band The Meeples broke up during the recordings for the vinyl album. Uh, the side A of the unfinished album quickly became cult followed by fans and critics around the world. 
uh, but you're turning it into one of the most intriguing legends of rock and roll history. Now, 50 years later, the band is finally re reunited to finish the B side with the help of a team of the best musical producers, which is going to be you. Now, what, what happens is you're going to be spinning this, this record's rondelle on the turntable, literally, to choose an action within their reach. And then each round, it represents a song recorded on the A side of the album, which you're sort of working on. And then that's going to help you gather information to aid your B side, which is what you're building in front of you. And then after listening to all the songs on the A side, which is about six to eight rounds, uh, depending on the player count, the game ends. And then whoever contributed the most effectively to the construction of their B side, which is the one that they're making, is going to be the winner. So I think this is very interesting that you're, you're, you're getting different audio tracks, you're putting them together, you're trying to line certain things up. That's the A side, that's sort of more of like what's going on with everybody, but then you're building the B side, which is your B side. The theme seems awesome, the rondelles I love, the components and the way that they interweave these look just amazing. So I'm really excited about this one, High Five from Smirk and Dagger Games. Number five. This next one is called Noon Attack, which is building the, the Ice Pyramid. This is designed by Kane Klenko, which I think is one of the most underrated designers. He's done a lot of popular games, and I really like his design. Very streamlined designer. Uh, and in this, you're going to be building a three-dimensional uh, uh, ice sculpture, but everyone is sort of building it by you know, interaction on the main board. But there's also some area control. There's set collections. Uh, you're going to be trying to get different cards per different type. Uh, so it's it's called a three-dimensional construction game and again you're gonna be building a, uh, a pyramid together in a mountain of ice but it's not cooperative so you're you're going to be building things and you're going to be getting different types of cards depending on where you build but you're also building in certain places for that area control so each pillar of the stone placed you receive different cards that have different values that will affect your score of different icons that will affect your score in different ways and they all score sort of differently uh, and for every four pillars that's built, a new square, then a new level gets built up, upwards. And so you build this big three-dimensional thing. So from a table presence, it looks amazing. People are building this in a communal way, so there's some, some lots of interaction that's going to be there. But at the same time, where you build is going to be telling you which cards to get, which is going to help you score set collection in all sorts of different ways. So again, it's going to be one of those sort of things that family weight style, but it's going to have great table presence and have some interesting mechanisms going on. It's Kane Klenko. So... Uh, Noon Attack, this is coming out by Cosmos. Number four. This next one is called Fromage, which is French for cheese. So you are a French cheesemaker in the early, uh, the early 20th century. And so you're going to be making, aging, and selling your cheeses. Now, you're trying to become the most prestigious cheesemaker in all of France by running a highly successful creamery and crafting exceptional cheeses. Now, this is a uh, simultaneous worker placement game where, pl where you're going to be placing workers to make cheese and gather resources, but you're going to be doing it from a specific quadrant of the board that's facing you. But then, once all players have placed their workers, the board rotates, aging any cheeses that were made and presenting everyone with sort of new quadrants to place your, your workers into. And you'll be scoring prestige points by selling cheeses to the four different locations and by efficiently ma uh, managing and upgrading your creamery. Now, this is designed by Ben Rossett and, and uh, Matthew O'Malley. They're the team that did sort of search for, search for Planet X, search for Lost Species, Between Two Cities, Between Two K Cities of Mad, Mad King Ludwig. So tried and true design team. This looks super interesting because it's a Euro game. It's a worker placement game. It's got simultaneous things that I like. But it's sort of an economic game as well. But the other interesting thing is when you place something, you get to decide like which direction it's pointing. And depending on which direction it's pointing, when you circle the board around, that tells you how soon you're going to get that worker back. But it's also how long it's aging. And obviously, the longer you let it age, the more benefits, but then you, the less actions you're going to be taking more frequently. So this looks going to have a very interesting timing element, planning element, cool theme. Uh, and designers I like, and that's why it's this high on this list, and that's Fromage. Number three. The next one is Pagan Fate of Roanoke. Now, this is an expandable deduction card game set in the colonial America of 1587. Now, this is an asymmetrical game uh, where witches struggle against a witch hunter. Now, 
The witch strives to complete a ritual of, of uh, renaturation, uh, and the hunter tries to discover her true identity among nine villagers. Now, each turn, the two players will use their action pawns on, on active villages to draw cards, to play cards, gain influence. Now, each player has their own variable card deck of 50 cards, and with the cards, the witch can do things like brew powerful potions and improve their familiar and cast enhancements and charms while the witch hunter enlists aliens, claims strategic locations, and ruthlessly investigates the villagers. Now, um, as the witch, your objective is to collect enough secrets to perform a, a ritual so, so potent that the entire region falls under your spell and Mother Nature will reclaim the island. But as the hunter, you gather all the allies and support you can muster to bring the witch to justice before her fatal ritual comes to fruition. Now, this just seems super interesting. I love two-player games. I like asymmetrical games. I like deep, thinky card games like this. Each player is going to be playing a completely different game. Some people have sort of said this ha it's somewhat familiar to, like, say, Android Netrunner, where you have two completely different games that you're each playing against each other. Um, and so, but they ask, the theme is great. I love sort of the witch theme last year at Halloween time. You might not have seen it, but I went to Salem, uh, Salem Mass for, for Halloween, did some ho top, top 10 games of Halloween. I actually grew up in that area. So I like the witch theme, and I like the aspect that there's two different games. One of them's playing a deduction game. The other one's trying to... You know, do different things, and it just seems super interesting. I've heard great things about this game, but everything is saying, "Oh man, this." I know this one has like a steep learning curve because you're basically learning two different games and you're teaching it and such. But it looks like the depth's there, and it's an expandable card game that you can add to as time goes on. So, this sounds really cool, and that's uh, this is from Cap. This is gonna be at the Capstone Games booth. Uh, they're bringing it over from Europe. I can't remember who the original uh, publishers publisher is of this, but this is Roanoke. Uh, sorry, Pagan Fate of Roanoke. Number two. This next one is a game, oh my gosh, from a company I love, Restoration Games. When I was a kid, I played a ton of crossbows and catapults. And they redid this, uh, and it's coming out now, and it's going to be a Gen Con. Uh, crossbows and catapults, the Fortress War version is the one that has more bricks, has more special abilities, more weapons and things like that. It's like the sort of the deluxe edition version. Um, and again, it's from Restoration Games, who is one of my favorite companies of all time. Uh, and this is basically, this, this is a remake of the 1983 classic game, which I played a ton, of Kinetic Warfare. So each player is going to build their own castle. Then players take turns using their weapons to fire discs at the, opposing, uh, the opponent's castle, trying to knock over their warrior figures. Now this new version features, this isn't just the old rubber bands, folks, like back in the day. These feature highly engineered weapons, more detailed building bricks, and deeper gameplay. Uh, the new weapons no longer use these little rubber bands, but they're replaced by spring-powered and pinch-to-fire technology that ensures reliable velocity and reward, reward player skill. Now, uh, on, the, on the building side, the castles are constructed using a variety of detailed components to allow for, more, for larger and more intricate and varied structures. Uh, and the Fortress War also features uh, detailed mercenary miniatures, a deck of asymmetrical tactic cards that let you take special actions, uh, and recruit mercenaries to the battlefield, uh, where essentially you're going to you know, use your unique abilities to turn the tide in your favor. Again, this is a game that I loved as a kid. Restoration Games makes everything better and, and uh, makes it a good game on top of the nostalgia that's there. And I know that they try to go against nostalgia because they don't want you to like the game just for the nostalgia. They don't want you to like the game because it's a good game, and that's what they do. But you add nostalgia to that, that's why it's so high on this list. Crossbows and Catapults by your Restoration Games. Number one. Before we get to the moment you've been waiting for, I want to let you know of an upcoming opportunity to win money while gaming. The World Series of Board Gaming is in Las Vegas from September 22nd to 26th, and they're giving away over $200,000 of cash and prizes, including Super Bowl-style rings, to the winners. Now, there are 16 different games available to play, like Ticket to Ride, Heat Pedal to the Metal, Earth, Brass, Birmingham, and more. Now, you can click the link below to learn more details of how it works and to receive $25 off your entry using the promo code GAMEBOYGEEK. All right, my number one two years ago was a deduction game called Turing Machine. Uh, and it came up from Hachette Board Games. And I gotta tell you, the, I reviewed it as soon as I got back from Gen Con. I said, you know what? Not a lot of games live up to my number one anticipated. It's really hard to do, it's kind of unfair, but it, it did. I really liked the game a lot. This year, there's another deduction game coming out from Hachette Board Games, and it's coming out from the same designer that did Turing Machine, and this is called 
Chronologic. This one is called Paris 1920 because there's actually three of them coming out. I think only one of them's coming out at, at Gen Con. This is Paris 1920. There's two other boxes coming out soon. Now it's actually, uh, the publisher name is Super Meeple, but Hachette, yeah, it's gonna be at the Hachette Board Games Group because of the distributor here in North America. Now in this game, it is pretty much a game without a lot of mechanisms and pure deduction. No randomness. That's what I love. I don't love a lot of cutesy little mechanisms. I don't like worker placement put in with my deduction. I like deduction. And I want the deduction to be as streamlined as possible. Take all the mechanisms and streamline as I can. Let's get to the meat, which is the deduction. That's what this game does. Uh, you're going to be collecting clues about the movements of implicated characters by determining where they were at the time of the incident. So which location were they, what time were they, and which character it is. So on your turn, you're going to align a suspect card with a, sp with a special sort of perforated tile, and you're going to get two pieces of information. The first piece of information is for, your, is for you. It's a private piece of information, but the second one is gonna be shared with all the players, which means that on everyone's turn, you're gonna be learning something, which is the mark of a good deduction game. Designers, everyone should learn something on everyone's turn in a deduction game. That's what makes them good. So this is a clever twist of having shared and private information. Now this game has 15 scenarios, okay? And again, there's two more boxes coming soon. Um, and there's also a, a free pack of seven additional investigations on Super Meeple's website that I've already kind of looked at. Uh, and there's booster packs that are all going to be on their way too with harder contact. And so it is a 15 scenario. Once you have solved something, you will know the answer. So theoretically, this game is going to be 15 games long. However, I've read a little bit online that like, unless you're using the same exact pattern for your questioning, when you play the same scenario twice, assuming there's some time that's, that's gone between the times you've played it, it's really hard to remember all the final results after you've played all the scenarios. So the experience when you play with new people will change in regard to the questions that you were asked and the order that you've learned information. So it sounds like, yes, there are 15 solutions that, that, that don't change. So at the very least, you're getting 15, but there's gonna be three total boxes. And again, there's, a, there's already seven more scenarios for free you can print off on their, on their website. There's gonna be more content coming, but if that's still, and, and most people don't play a game 15 times, folks, by the way. Um, but if that does worry you, again, it does sound like if you play through all the scenarios, you wait a month or so, you play them again, you're not going to remember the exact solution of every scenario. And you're not going to be getting the information the same way, right? So sounds like they're, they're not, you know, that, that they're possibly replayable as well. So that's it. I love deduction. This looks great. I can't wait to play this one. Uh, and that's Chrono Logic at the Hachette Board Games booth. Well, there you, there you go, folks. Now, keep in mind, next week, right before Gen Con starts, I'm going to be coming out with a video of my top 10 games at Gen Con that I've already had the pleasure of playing, whether it was an early copy, whether it was just last week as new things are coming in right before they come out. But that is a list where I've actually played everything. This list, I had no idea. I'm just looking at what sounds and looks cool. That list is tried and true because I played everything. That's coming next week. Subscribe if you have not done so already to make sure you don't miss that. This has been the Game Boy Geek, breaking down barriers, growing relationships with board games, and helping you on the next one you love. Game Toppers upgrades every game you play, and they just launched their 4.5 Kickstarter, which will introduce the new Galactic Mycroft and Watson Game Toppers with interchangeable rail inlays, as well as new game mats, miniature gaming terrain packs, leg kit options, dining covers, accessories, and amazing package deals. Search for Game Toppers on Kickstarter or go to GameToppersLLC.com.